Hey everyone, and welcome back to this class, the NumPy stack in Python. In this lecture, we're going to expand on this idea that all machine learning interfaces are the same. When I say this, I think this question immediately comes to mind. If all model interfaces are the same, then which model should I choose? In the code, it takes no more lines of code to use linear regression than it does to use a neural network. So why shouldn't I always just pick the most powerful model? But more importantly, how do I know which model is the most powerful in the first place? All right, so these are all important questions. My answer, which I know is going to disappoint some of you, is that there is no shortcut. What are the rules of thumb, you might ask? The answer is, there is no shortcut. Yes, but surely you could offer some guidelines. The answer is, there is no shortcut. In this lecture, I'm going to give you some general ideas and concepts to follow. But for the most part, nothing will replace actually learning how these models work. That means learning the algorithms, understanding where they fail and where they succeed, and so forth. Nothing will replace that experience and knowledge. So let's start with a general overview. And by the way, if you want to learn about all the models that are available in Scikit-Learn, just go to the documentation. I'm sure that by now this type of thing is very easy for you. Let's start with the most basic type of model, linear models. These are called linear models because the geometry is always a line, plane, or hyperplane. In other words, they are never curved. You can probably already see a significant disadvantage here. For example, it would never learn how to discriminate between these two groups of green dots and blue dots on the right. But one advantage is that these models are very easy to interpret. So for example, if my formula is weight equals 80 plus 2 times height, then I can immediately see that for every inch taller you are, your weight goes up by 2 pounds. In general, you lose this kind of interpretability with other models. After this, we have more basic models, but these are nonlinear. However, don't be fooled. Just because these are nonlinear does not mean they are more powerful than a linear model. To really know which model is going to work better on your particular dataset, you just need to experiment. Some examples of these basic models are naive Bayes, decision trees, and k-nearest neighbor. In this course, it's not my goal to talk about any of the details of these models, since I have other courses that go very in-depth, but I just want you to know that they exist and where they fit relative to other models. Another category of models, which I would not consider basic, are ensemble models. We've seen one example of this already, the random forest. Further examples include AdaBoost, Extra Trees, and Gradient Boosted Trees. The way these generally work is this. They take a very large number of individual decision trees, say 200 of them, but they train these trees over different subsets of the input data X. So what you can get out of it is 200 different trees, all trained in a different way. Well, it turns out that when you average the predictions from these trees, the result is very powerful. In fact, there's a variant of the gradient boosted tree called XGBoost, which has been used to win a significant number of Kaggle contests. Ensemble methods were also used to win the famous Netflix prize, which was a $1 million prize hosted by Netflix to predict movie ratings. Needless to say, ensemble methods are very powerful. And this also brings up a really good point of where these models fit relative to each other. So for example, we can see that ensemble methods depend on decision trees because they are made up of decision trees. So you'd probably want to learn about decision trees first so you know how they work so that when you talk about ensemble models, which makes use of decision trees, you have a better overall perspective. Another model that kind of sits on its own is the support vector machine or SVM. The support vector machine is very interesting because it was the state of the art and the go-to machine learning model for a long time. These days, that title goes to neural networks, but in the past, 
SVMs actually beat out neural networks at many tasks. So SVMs are also very powerful nonlinear classifiers, but one problem with them is that they don't scale. In other words, if your dataset is too large, it becomes infeasible to use this model. These days, because most datasets are large, this immediately disqualifies the SVM. The final category I want to talk about here is deep learning methods. In fact, we've already used deep learning in this course with the MLP classifier. Of course, this barely scratches the surface. As of the writing of this lecture, I already have 10 deep learning courses with more on the way. There is so much to learn and even I'm still constantly learning. As I mentioned earlier in this section, deep learning is responsible for producing new state-of-the-art results in both computer vision and NLP, which cover the two fundamental data types that seem to appear naturally in the digital world. At the same time, unlike the other models we've discussed in this lecture, deep learning models are not really plug and play. Sure, there is the MLP classifier, which works on the type of data that we looked at in this course, but modern deep learning models are generally more complex. And so for that, you can't use scikit-learn, and you have to look to more specialized libraries such as Theano, TensorFlow, and Keras. In fact, it wasn't until recently that the MLP classifier was even included in scikit-learn, and there was discussion where people were against including it because of the fact that deep neural networks are not really meant to be plug and play. So to summarize this lecture, this is a table I think best captures what we just talked about. Now what I don't want you to do is take this table as gospel. There are always exceptions to the rule, and in machine learning, this happens more often than not. It's important to remember that machine learning is a field of experimentation, not a field of philosophy. So if you ever find yourself asking, how would such and such work in this situation, that is never a good idea. A better approach to take is to just code it up and see the results for yourself. Remember, experimentation, not philosophy. So we talked about five general groups. We've got linear models, more basic models that are simple but nonlinear. Then we have ensemble methods, SVM, and deep learning. Now keep in mind that this is my personal grouping, and it's what I think on this particular day. Maybe if you ask me another day, I might think something else. So again, what's more important is to learn about these models for yourself. So for linear models, some examples are linear regression and logistic regression. They are not that powerful, but they are easy to interpret, they scale well, and it's easy to use them for plug and play on any data set. Importantly, they can be useful for establishing a baseline. So if you want to show how good your new super powerful algorithm is, you might want to try a linear model first to have something to compare to. Next, we have some models that are still pretty basic, but not necessarily linear. They can be flexible and very expressive, but that does not necessarily mean they are powerful. I'm using the term powerful very loosely here, so you have to take this with a grain of salt. The advantage of these models is that they're easy to interpret, some of them scale well, and you can plug and play with them. Next we have ensemble methods. As we discussed, these are very powerful and have been used to win many actual machine learning prizes. They also generally scale very well and they can be used for plug and play. Ensemble methods are easy to parallelize, meaning they've been written for distributed computing frameworks such as Spark. So you can spread your workout across 100 different machines and get the results faster than you would have using just one machine. Next we have SVMs, which kind of just sits by itself. They're very powerful, and they used to be the go-to method for many people doing machine learning, but they just don't scale to today's datasets. Finally, we have deep learning. Very powerful and state-of-the-art for many tasks. They don't really scale per se, since training large neural networks has been known to take weeks or longer, but we can reduce the time necessary for training by using special hardware. Deep learning is the least plug-and-playable group of all these methods.